Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the press conference following today's Eurogroup video conference. Uh, before I give the floor to the President of the Eurogroup uh, to present the outcome of today's meeting, uh, let me just inform you that we have published one statement on Greece earlier and we will soon publish a statement on the ESM treaty reform and the common backstop to the SRF. Uh, so now, without further ado, let me pass the floor to the President of the Eurogroup. Thank you, Maria, and uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, I want to start by relating the success of our inclusive discussions with all EU 27 members. And I'm very pleased to announce that we have reached an agreement on the ratification of ESM treaty reform. The ESM was created and performed an important role during the last crisis, and the adjustments that we have agreed today will further develop the ESM's toolkit. We will now proceed to the signature of the treaty in January and launch the procedures for ratification at national level. The treaty reform also establishes a common backstop to the single resolution fund in the form of a credit line from the ESM. The backstop is a last resort. It's a further safety net at our disposal should we need it. It will reinforce and complement the resolution pillar of the banking union and will help to ensure that a bank failure does not harm the broader economy or indeed cause financial instability. I'm therefore pleased to announce that today we've also agreed to introduce the common backstop two years ahead of the original schedule. We will bring forward its operational date to the beginning of 2022. This decision reflects the important progress achieved in reducing risks in the banking system. But this is not the end of the road. We will continue to advance risk reduction using existing credible frameworks such as EU-wide stress tests, reinforced regulatory requirements for specific institutions and enhanced surveillance to deal with structural issues. Since the onset of the pandemic, the Eurogroup has shown our determination to tackle the economic challenges head on. And today's agreement again confirms our unity of purpose. This is a crucial stepping stone in our path to strengthen the banking union, and it is an important complement to our efforts in supporting economic recovery. And I want to acknowledge and thank uh, all of the efforts of uh, the institutions that are present here today to get to this point and want to recognise again the unity of purpose of all of my fellow purpose ministers in the agreement of this evening. And I also want to pay tribute to my predecessor, Mario Santano, for all of the work that he did to get to the point of agreement this evening. We also took stock of the steady progress in the high-level working group on other elements of banking union. And now that we've reached agreement today, we're now in a good position to move forward in other areas. I will report to the Euro Area Summit next week on the state of progress for banking union. And we want to keep our progress and our momentum going. I want to say a word about the uh, regular Eurogroup agenda, where we welcomed the Managing Director of the IMF, Kristalina Forheva, and we also welcomed the new Minister from Malta, our new co colleague, Clyde Karunia. The Fund joined us today to discuss the outcome of their Article 4 consultation with the Euro area. This was an opportunity to appraise where we stand with our many challenges, and I'm pleased that this currently substantial policy consensus in the Eurogroup 
and I'm glad the Fund confirmed that our policy response has so far risen to the scale of challenges we face. We'll come back to these issues in more detail in December when we agree the Council recommendations on economic policy of the euro area for 2021. In our next meeting, we'll also take a closer look at the draft budgetary plans for 2021, and the Commission gave a very helpful steering presentation on that work uh, and provided a qualitative assessment on the need for timely targeted and temporary measures for next year, which is very much in line with the Eurogroup's assessment. Finally, the Eurogroup also took stock of the good progress in Spain, in Cyprus and in Portugal, and in my own country, Ireland, on the basis of the post-programme surveillance reports. We also acknowledged the good progress in Greece on the basis of the enhanced surveillance report. There's never any room for complacency, but these reports indicate us that the risks arising from the pandemic, they're being monitored and they are being responded back to by my fellow ministers for finance. In the case of Greece, we agreed that the very positive assessment warrants the approval of the next tranche of policy contingent debt measures. And this is worth 767 million euro. We have now released a statement based on the commendable hard work and good results for Greece and for the euro area. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. I pass the floor to Commissioner Gentiloni. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, good evening. Uh, indeed, the, the, the meeting today was a very good one. It was a success. And first of all, let me pay tribute to uh, Pascal, uh, the president of the Eurogroup, uh, because I have to say that uh, in these uh, weeks, he worked very hard uh, building on the work also of his predecessor, but uh, without his uh, steering inclusiveness and commitment, uh, this agreement would have been uh, much more difficult. So thank you, Pascal. It was really a, a great contribution to this uh, success. Uh, of course, the, uh, we um, uh, were able to reach this agreement also on the basis of the, the risk reduction um, that, that we uh, analyzed uh, today and also uh, on the situation uh, of the banking sector that is far uh, more stronger and more resilient than it was uh, 10, days ago, uh, 10 years ago. And without this, I, I think this kind of uh, new agreement would have been uh, much more difficult. So the agreement we reached on the uh, ESM uh, treaty and on the backstop uh, is good news for the stability and the resilience of the euro area. And as such, it is good news for our citizens and businesses. Uh, we are not at the end of this road. We had now the signature of the treaty, of the amendment. We have the ratification process. But uh, today, we really made a substantial step. And it was a great uh, success. Uh, and also demonstrated a will of compromise among ministers um, with the, the, the president role that I think is very promising for the challenges that are ahead of us. We began our discussion with an exchange of views with uh, Kristalina Georgieva on the IMF uh, Article 4 assessment at the Euro area. And we were very pleased and encouraged to, uh, to see uh, how similar is the assessment of uh, the IMF and uh, the one that we made 
um, uh, as commission. Uh, the, the managing director um, made particularly three points that I, I deem very important. One, the need to ensure an effective deployment of next generation uh, EU. Uh, second, uh, on the fact that the pandemics tend to worsen inequality and that this pandemic will be no exception. And so we should work strongly to avoid the increase of inequalities among regions, generations, and the society. And third, uh, the importance of not withdrawing policy support too soon. We are very well aware of the risks that this would entail. And we have made very clear that fiscal policy should continue to support the econo economic recovery in 2020. One, um, I will not run through the conclusions of these post-program surveillance for Cyprus, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain, but uh, at the end, all countries, this is the conclusion, retain their capacity to repay their debt vis-à-vis -vis the ESM. On Greece, I presented the eighth enhanced surveillance report, and our key conclusion was that in spite of the adverse circumstances, Greece has taken the necessary actions to enact its reform commitments. Most notable is the major reform of the insolvency framework, which should be swiftly implemented via the adoption of secondary legislation and the rollout of the necessary IT systems. Uh, there has been also good progress with fiscal structural reforms, speeding up investments and reforms of public administration. So some welcome and well-deserved good news for Greece today, despite the difficult situation and the road ahead of the country. And for this reason, the Eurogroup has agreed to the release of the next set of debt measures worth 767 million. One final word on draft budgeted plan, because as Pascal said, we will come back to these uh, in two weeks. Uh, so it was a, a first presentation. Uh, what is clear that we are moving gradually from for emergency to recovery. In 2021, two thirds of the measures planned for next year worth around 1.5% of GDP are not emergency, but a more generally recovery supporting nature. Only 1% will, will still be emergency measures. Uh, and of course, member states will need to assess whether to extend their emergency support or to withdraw it. I think the premature withdrawal, I repeat, will be a mistake. When adjusted for the expected withdrawal, the euro area fiscal stance in 2021 should continue to be supportive at 1.4% of GDP, which is the right stance at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Now I pass the floor to the ESM's Managing Director, Klaus Regling. Yes, thank you and good evening to all of you. I'm happy, of course, that the Eurogroup agreed on the reform of the ESM treaty tonight. And I also want to thank the president of the Eurogroup um, for this huge achievement. I also want to thank the European institutions, the Commission, the ECB, the SRB, um, who have always supported um, this reform of the ESM treaty. And I'm happy about that, not because this gives us extra work at CSM, although we are prepared to do that, but I'm happy because this reform of the ESM treaty will move us towards completing banking union, and that will increase confidence in markets and also confidence among depositors. And that will make monetary union more resilient and also will strengthen the international role of the euro. After the ratification, and that will happen next year and may take a year, the amended ESM treaty will allow the ESM to become the backstop 
to the SRF, the body that ensures orderly resolution of failing banks. This means that if the resources of the SRF are depleted, the ESM can lend money to the SRF to finance the resolution of a bank. The early introduction of the backstop in 2022 is very important, particularly during the current um, situation where all our member states suffer the economic consequences of COVID-19. So this will really increase confidence in the markets, minimize contagion in case of bank failures, and support financial stability in the euro area. It is good to remember that the ESM is the lender of last resort for 19 euro area countries and for their 340 million citizens. The ratification of the ESM treaty, um, when it is concluded, um, will allow the ESM to play a stronger role in financial assistance programs, if requested, and of course, together with the European Commission. Um, as a result of the ESM treaty reform, the financial instruments will be adapted. In particular, our precautionary credit line will be made easier to use. And all these are important stepping stones to make monetary union stronger, as pres the president said. A quick word on the countries um, where we had the post-program monitoring today, Cyprus, Portugal, Ireland, and Spain. Um, these are the countries, four of the five countries, um, where the ESM provided financial assistance in the previous crisis. All these countries, of course, suffer, like all of our member states, from the economic consequences of COVID-19. Ireland may also be affected by Brexit, depending whether it's a no deal or a well-organized Brexit. Still, we see no immediate risk for these countries to make their payments to the ESM and EFSF, certainly not the next 12 months. Um, but I think it's also clear that for all these countries, the EU Recovery Fund creates an opportunity to boost their growth prospects and facilitate fiscal adjustment. On Greece, where we um, discuss the AIDS Enhanced Surveillance Report. Um, the President and the Commissioner talked about that. Um, Greece is also affected by the pandemic, like all member states. Um, but as the Enhanced Surveillance Report makes clear, Greece has continued its reform process under difficult circumstances. For example, important steps have been taken to improve the business environment, um, to increase the effectiveness of the public administration. Um, it's also important um, that the newly legislated insolvency framework has been put in place. Um, the commissioner mentioned that. Um, and based on the assessment, as you heard, the ministers agreed to release the fourth tranche of debt relief that the euro area grants Greece if the country fulfills um, its reform commitments. This is the fourth time this happens, and we will make the disbursement um, after national procedures have been completed, certainly um, before the end of the year. The total amount is 767 million euro, and it has several components, but I think you may remember that from the past. Um, I think I will end here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me now open the floor for questions. Please uh, switch on your camera before asking your question and please introduce yourself. I'll start with Bjarke Smith Mayer. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question, Maria. Um, a question to um, Pascal Donahue, uh, if I may. Uh, I'm curious, can you just explain the controversy over the comma? Um, it would be great to get a sense as to uh, what uh, the distinction was between a comma, a semicolon, and uh, why it was an issue. 
Um, also, now that you've received, reached this deal, um, what's next? What's the next big topic? Uh, dare I say, Edis? Thank you. President. Minister. President, can you, can you hear us? Hello. Okay. Okay, maybe let's... Minister? Hello, Maria. Yes, hello. Now we can hear you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, so we had a, uh, many negotiations and discussions over the last number of weeks, and in particular over the weekend. Um, and uh, I'm not going, to, not going to go into the detail of any one of them, uh, because they were all important to the colleagues who were raising them. What I just want to reaffirm uh, this evening is that what we have reached is a political agreement. The law of the European Union stands very, very clearly uh, with the independent institutions being the only bodies that interpret it. And in the final text that we released this evening, uh, it made clear uh, that the uh, law of the EU uh, with regard to the different issues that we were discussing is unchanged. Um, and that it is up to the different institutions to interpret it as they see fit and in accordance with their mandate. Uh, and that was the background to some of the discussions that we had across the afternoon in relation to uh, what is next. Um, I'm, I'm really, really pleased on behalf of all of my colleagues that we did reach agreement this evening. This has been really difficult. A lot of work has gone into getting that agreement. Uh, and a huge amount of coordination uh, was delivered to facilitate an agreement on these matters today. Uh, what we will be moving on to is, I hope, a successful uh, discussion in December, and I believe it will be discuss a successful discussion regarding how we can adopt Euro area recommendations uh, that are appropriate for where the people of Europe stand at the moment and for where our economies stand at the moment, uh, and then looking at how we can make steady progress in other areas of banking union. Um, of course, we got an update from the high-level working group on EDIS. Uh, that provides something that we will be able to discuss. But I'm also aware of other issues in banking union that we need to move to soon. For example, the issue of how liquidity is provided to banks during resolution. So there's an array of topics lots of areas that we can move to, um, and as I've done now over the last number of months, I'll be engaging very closely and regularly with all members of the Eurogroup. I'll identify a consensus on what we can make progress on, and we'll work intensively to deliver that progress, and that's what we've done today, and that is what I want to keep on doing. Thank you. Next question is for Athanasios. Thanks very much, Athanasios, CNA and Star TV Greece. Uh, two questions, if I may. First one, did you have any indication today from any country, and in Greece in particular, that they might intend to use the ESM pandemic line now that the uh, uh, pandemic is uh, getting worse, especially there? And secondly, since there will be some kind of delay in the implementation of the uh, uh, of the next generation EU and the multi-annual financial framework, are you planning or thinking about bridging the gap somehow with means created by the Eurogroup? Thanks. Okay. President. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, to deal with each of them, uh, firstly, uh, uh, in relation to your question about accessing the ESM, uh, COVID credit facility. The critical thing is that that instrument is there. And I want to reaffirm uh, what Klaus has said on many occasions, which is that uh, uh, 
the financial markets absolutely understand that this is a precautionary facility that will be or could be accessed by member states for precautionary reasons and there is no stigma associated with accessing that tool and using that credit facility. Uh, it is up to individual member states to access that facility if they want to. The situation is currently unchanged, uh, but that is a reflection on the uh, work that has happened within member states to deliver uh, the right policy change which they can afford to because of the quality of their national finances and because of the very quick work of the European Commission in deciding to access the escape clause within the fiscal rules. Uh, so the critical thing is that that facility is there if countries need it and uh, the fact that they haven't used it to date uh, does not mean it might not be needed in the future and it is there in the future if countries need it. In relation to the delay in the recovery and resilience facility, um, Minister Schultz uh, confirmed to the Eurogroup earlier on today that while the discussions are difficult, uh, Germany and the Commission are doing all that can be done to try to reach agreement. Uh, and uh, I believe uh, that the facility will be delivered uh, on the original timings. If there is a delay, I think it will be a, a small one. And member states have ample ability uh, to respond back with national measures if they need to in 2021 and in 2020. And that's what they are currently doing. Uh, uh, so um, I believe the recovery and resilience facility uh, will be delivered uh, broadly on the timings that were indicated. And I think in the euro area recommendations that you'll see in a few weeks' time, you'll see all of my colleagues take, using the flexibility that has been granted to them by the European Commission uh, to be able to support their citizens at a time of great challenge. Um, next question is for Angela Mauro. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. The, uh, what makes you think that the uh, ESM will be used by member states for, say, banks? So you, you, you find the agreement on the backstop tonight. Uh, aren't you afraid that it will be the same uh, that that we've been seeing with the, credit, with the pandemic credit line. None of the member states are using the ESM. Uh, what makes you confident that it won't be uh, the same with banks in the future? Thank you. President? Uh, uh, so, firstly, uh, if member states decide they do, that they do need support in dealing with a banking difficulty, they will be accessing the single resolution fund. And the single resolution fund, in turn, will be backed up by the ESM. Uh, and uh, um, to be very precise, I'm not saying that it will be used in the future. What I am saying is that it is available in case it needs to be used. And given that the Single Resolution Fund is a very well-established facility now within our banking union architecture, um, I, um, I am very confident that if member states decide it is needed, they will access it, and then Klaus and the ESM will be backing up the SRF in case further support is needed for the SRF. Um, on the use of the ESM overall, uh, I just want to emphasise again the fact that it is not being used at the moment is a reflection of the coordinated efforts between the ECB, the European Commission and finance ministers. Um, so we have you know, two successes here. The first success is that our efforts to date are sufficient 
to support governments in their response back to COVID-19. And then the second success is that we have agreed on the new facility for the ESM uh, before we get into moments of greater crisis or moments of greater difficulty. Uh, we have planned ahead to have this tool ready and I think if any countries decide they do need to use it, it will be so well established and so well understood that again any concerns about stigma or uh, I think will be eliminated uh, both now and at that point in the future. Maybe I can complement that. Um, as Pascal said, indeed, the PCS pandemic crisis support is available till the end of 2022. Um, and it has had a positive impact on markets already, which, by the way, also the International Monetary Fund in its consultation confirmed that they have the same um, assessment that this already serves its purpose by being available. Um, and it's less important whether it's actually um, drawn on or not. The, um, the backstop to the SRF that the ESM will be able to provide once the ESM treaty is ratified um, is structured in a different way. Um, and actually, the main reason why we have to change the ESM treaty is because we could not otherwise um, give a um, facility a loan to the SRF, because according to the old ESM treaty, which is still in place, we can only lend to governments. We could not lend to the SRF, which is a European institution, um, with a new treaty, with the amended treaty um, that will be ratified next year. This will become possible, um, and it will only happen if the SRF runs out of money. And we hope it will never happen. It will never be needed. Um, this is very much comparable to the situation you find in the United States, where the FDIC also collects money from the banks. That's what the FIF does also from European banks. These are the own resources. And for most times, that money is sufficient. In the US, when there's a big crisis, which happened twice the last 60 years, the FDIC has a credit line with the U.S. Treasury. As we have no Treasury in the euro area, um, the ESM will be asked to provide such a credit line, but hopefully it will never be needed. Thank you. Um, last question goes to Tommaso Galavotti. Yes. In the beginning, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good evening. Thank you for the floor. Just two quick questions. The first one uh, is about what uh, the president of the European Parliament, David Sassoli, said. He said that it would be wise to transform the ESM in an EU institution, as the Commission proposed in 2017, because otherwise it, it is unlikely that member states will... Uh, ever use uh, the pandemic crisis support as a, the, there will be plenty of uh, EU instruments to get money from as the recovery fund and so on. And the second one is, if I may, is about the single limb CACs, uh, which are, are one of the most uh, important uh, features of the reform. Uh, I wonder why was it so important to, to introduce this kind of CACs which, is, which are basically an instrument to make more orderly uh, the restructuring of a sovereign debt. Are you thinking of a possible default of a Eurozone member in the next years, given the rising level, levels of uh, public debt due, due to the corona crisis? Thank you. President? Uh, thank you very much for your question. So firstly, uh, I, I think uh, the uh, question about whether the credit facility of the ESM is used in the future, in speaking to my many finance minister colleagues, that question has nothing to do with the institutional status of the ESM. Uh, the ESM is now a fundamental um, pillar 
of the economic architecture of the European Union and what is behind countries currently not applying for it is because other institutions in the European Union and member state governments coordinated their efforts so quickly and acted very quickly before the summer to ensure that there would be an accommodative monetary policy background from the ECB that would then be utilised by member states in putting in place the right actions within their economies. Uh, uh, so the fact that that facility is not currently accessed, to repeat again, is a reflection of the success of our efforts in dealing with COVID-19 uh, so far from a funding point of view. Uh, and it is there to use if countries need to use it. And that decision, I don't believe, will be influenced by the institutional nature of the ESM. Um, we have so much we need to do. We have so much help that we need to give uh, to citizens to help them get their job back, to help European employers to employ people again. Um, and that, that is what we are doing, and the ESM is a safety net to those efforts. In relation to the uh, single limb uh, um, uh, dimension of our agreement today, uh, firstly, uh, we are absolutely confident uh, that the levels of uh, sovereign debt that are being incurred by member states at the moment is manageable and uh, will be affordable in the years to come. And that is driven by the way in which my colleagues have managed their national finances. And it is also driven by the way in which additional debt at the moment is being funded at lower yields than normal, because we're in a time that is not normal. Uh, uh, so uh, we have full confidence in the ability of that debt to be funded in the future. And uh, the uh, uh, single limb clause that is there is merely a uh, acknowledgement by the Eurogroup that these are the kind of uh, agreements that do need to be in place for responding back carefully uh, to challenges that we, we may face in the future. And what we are looking to do is make these agreements now, have them in place, uh, but to repeat again all of the decisions that are being made by colleagues at the moment in relation to sovereign borrowing um, are affordable and will be managed carefully by colleagues in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that ends our press conference today.